by just a few minutes to each of you. Uh, my name is Dr. Robert Cosby, and I work with uh, Mr. Clarence Craig at the Adult Protective Services Unit of the Department of Human Services for District of Columbia Government and Family Services Administration. A lot of words, a lot of bureaucracy, but we're here to talk to you a little bit about Adult Protective Services and what has been uh, happening in APS. Um, and so we want to start with giving you a little history and background as to what APS really is, um, our history, and then take us forward to our processes that you may or may not have had an opportunity to interact with us. Um, why don't we start with, uh, is there, are there a show of hands of those folks who have already interacted with APS so far? Okay, so we have uh, uh, three folks in, in here that have, so that's good. Um, uh, we are also cons constantly trying to evaluate how we can do our jobs better and how we can meet the need here in the District of Columbia. Uh, we are a relatively small operation. We cover uh, the waterfront on all aspects related to uh, adult protective services. Anyone have an idea of what we mean when we say a vulnerable adult, what we're talking about? Mm -hmm. Anyone? Someone who um, has diminished capacity or is lacking Excellent. It's almost like you were a plant for us. <laughs> uh, so uh, um, we try to be able to mitigate and or uh, lessen uh, the impact for those individuals that have been uh, uh, vulnerable adults uh, that have been abused, neglected, self-neglected, or exploited. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, Mr. Craig and I, in just a little bit. but. I want to be able to sort of share with you our, our mandate. Uh, we were founded in 1984, uh, mayor's and mandate, and that of the uh, district council. Uh, and we have uh, uh, been uh, gathered together as a unit to actually uh, go out and to investigate <coughs> aspects of uh, abuse, neglect, self-neglect, uh, and exploitation, as I mentioned. Uh, since 1984, we have uh, gotten some additional mandate uh, in terms of self-neglect. Uh, maybe some of you may have remembered a lady by the name of Karen Barquin at the D.C. Office on Aging, who was a, uh, a very much a champion for older persons, and uh, they named, uh, she died suddenly uh, from a bout of pneumonia. Uh, and so uh, uh, they named this... Uh, uh, Self-Neglect Act is an expansion of the uh, services and supports that Adult Protective Services has provided for uh, for the District of Columbia to call it the Karen Barquin uh, Self-Neglect uh, Expansion Act of 2006. Uh, what that does or what that means uh, largely is that we have the mandate to be able to go out into the community to work on behalf of referrals from all over the country if necessary, or internationally, if they are in fact uh, people in the District of Columbia and they have a District of Columbia address, uh, potentially we go out if they're in the community. Now, who goes out and who, who are we? So, um, our history is uh, we try to cover the waterfront, as I mentioned. We cover uh, all uh, eight wards here in the District of Columbia. Uh, anyone that lives in the community. Uh, however, uh, we do work in conjunction with some other agencies like the Long-Term Care Ombudsman and uh, with the Department of, uh, of Health and also with uh, 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 Healthcare Finance, Department of Healthcare Finance, and uh, working with the Healthcare Ombudsman in terms of covering issues related to investigations that occur perhaps in hospitals or uh, some cases in nursing facilities. Welcome, uh, glad to see you. Uh, come in, have a seat. Um, we're talking about uh, motors and uh, how to get your car from one place to the next. Uh, no, we're not talking about that. We're talking about adult protective services. And so uh, if you come to hear something and to answer or hear questions that we will pose of you and to ask questions of us, then you come to the right place. Um, I'll let you get, uh, get your something to drink and get situated and then uh, continue uh, quickly. But just in terms of quick background, uh, any of you know uh, how many cases of adult 
adult abuse, neglect, uh, self-neglect or exploitation happen in a particular year, say, this past year? Anyone have an idea? We were able to investigate 1,485 wow. cases this past year. Uh, a, a growing number in two specific areas uh, in terms of self-neglect and an increase in that number and in, uh, in exploitation, an increase in terms of financial exploitation. Does that number mean people that were reported to you or, or things you good, investigated and found? Good question. Calls? He asked, uh, everyone here this curious question? Uh, uh, that we're looking at the, the definition or at least the difference between what we mean by those that were referred versus those that actually became cases that were investigated. Mm -hmm. And the number that I, the 1485 number that I re uh, referred to is actually numbers of cases that were investigated. Uh, the prior year, in FY15, uh, we had, I believe, 931 cases. And as you'll hear Mr. Craig talk about uh, in just a little bit, um, we had an increase of over 500 cases between, uh, go from 931 to 1485. Yes, ma'am. What is the um, main case that's reported? What's the main type of case that's common? The most, the most often? Uh, right now, it's uh, cases of self-neglect that we see uh, a little more so. I mentioned uh, increasing numbers of, of financial exploitation that have come on board, but we see uh, cases of abuse um, as well as uh, uh, issues related to uh, neglect. Uh, yes, ma'am. What's the criteria for the cases that you, uh, APS decides to handle? The Another plan. Thank you for asking that question. Uh, we actually, we actually, uh, uh, have a process for our, our overall investigations. Uh, first of all, as I said, we are a small group and we, we cover the whole waterfront of issues in the District of Columbia as they relate to this, this topic of, uh, of uh, uh, financial exploitation, abuse, neglect, self-neglect. And so APS, Adult Protective Services, has 22 staff, or I should say we have spaces for 22. We, right now we have 20. Uh, and uh, we, the largest number of the, the 22 are social workers, and uh, we are divided into three primary units within the, uh, the structure. I should have started out by saying we bring you greetings on behalf of uh, our Department of Human Services Director, uh, Laura Zeilinger, and our uh, APS Chief, our uh, Direct Supervisor, uh, Dr. Sheila Jones. Uh, and. Uh, what we do on behalf of APS is to go out and to actually uh, bring uh, that information to you. Uh, and so that's why you have Mr. Craig and I out here today to be able to speak to you. Uh, but in, in our regular work, or I should say the day-to-day -day that we do on a regular basis, um, let me give you an example of a person who has started off when he was just a toddler. And he has been working in APS ever since. His name is Clarence Craig. Uh, he's, he, he's here. He's worked with APS for, for uh, just a few years. Um, Another just, plant in that. <laughs> I, I, I will say at least 20 years. And he started off uh, working uh, in intake and has largely continued in that capacity. Now is the supervisor for uh, that particular unit. So we have three units in Adult Protective Services uh, intake. Actually, it starts off with screening. We have a 24-hour, um, seven days a week, a 24-7 hotline, 202-541-3950 uh, number. We have some uh, materials for you, so I'll pass them out to you so you'll at least have an idea of, um, of where uh, that information comes from. Uh, and uh, this is designed to uh, carry your attention afterwards. So you don't need to look at all of this right now, but afterwards, now you need to listen to what I'm saying and what Mr. Craig will be saying. So uh, the process for these, uh, for our being able to find out a referral is we prefer to have the uh, people call on the hotline, that 541-3950 number that I mentioned to you. 
And the reason for that is it is one, a recorded line, but in addition to it being a recorded line, it's a way for us to be able to keep track of people on a regular basis uh, to be able to find out if, in fact, it's a self-referral for some cases. That's what we address. And in some instances, it's for referrals of individuals, and we need to be able to do it to find out uh, information. All of our information is confidential. Uh, so you need not worry that uh, we're providing information that the public is going to know about, uh, which is a very important piece. Now, let Mr. Craig speak to that in just a little bit. But in addition to that, what we really are trying to do is to make certain that we can get that information so that we know exactly uh, what's, what we're looking at in terms of a case, how to best be able to try and address it. And then once we have that information, we uh, have a, a, a red model team of individuals who are, uh, I think, over uh, 30 years of experience uh, active experience, actually it's probably closer to 50 years when I think about it, at any one time of individuals that actually meet to discuss uh, issues. And the, the red uh, model team meet Mondays through Fridays, uh, every day of the week, uh, that we are at the, the offices at 64 New York Avenue, are where we, uh, we reside. And they meet to try and discuss whether to uh, to review, evaluate, and decide to screen in or to screen out a particular case. And uh, when I say screen in or screen out, that review, evaluate, and decide is that team of individuals actually review the case, uh, listen to the merits of what has been presented to them, evaluate the vulnerabilities based upon our mandate. Uh, for example, if someone says, gee, um, I, I am fine, I, I work every day of the week, um, but I have a mental health problem and um, I think I'm going to kill myself. Uh, important issues, not necessarily adult protective services directly, but we try then to refer and or collaborate for a warm handoff to try and provide that information. Yes, ma'am. What issues are high priority? What issues do you give priority to? Okay, uh, good question. Everything that meets our mandate that we talked about in terms of individuals that are vulnerable to abuse, neglect, self-neglect, or exploitation, those are, in fact, uh, important issues, whether people, if they are in a vulnerable setting where they are in danger for their lives because a caregiver or someone else has tried to hurt them, physically abuse them, there are instances where uh, there's instances of self-neglect where they can't take care of themselves, they haven't been able to eat or bathe or uh, go to the bathroom. Uh, yes, ma'am. Sorry. I That's okay. Had, I had a case. Um, so what's your turnaround time then on trying to help somebody with you do deem them uh, uh, that they have experienced neglect or they've been referred to your office? Okay, so we are mandated, good question, uh, and she's not a plant, or maybe you really are a plant. Uh, uh, the issue related to, uh, and I was just getting to that, so you was a nice segue, uh, we make the determination in the red model review team whether or not it is an emergency or non-emergency. Uh, in cases of emergency, we go out within 24 hour period, a, a social worker is assigned and we try to uh, go out, in some cases, as soon as possible if we think that there is a, a significant uh, risk to the individual. And so we will try to do that. Uh, in instances that are not viewed as, uh, as emergency, meaning not life-threatening, emergency life-threatening, uh, we then try to go out and investigate within 10 days, 10 business days. Uh, and uh, we are actually moving to a different system of being able to go from the red model review that we mentioned, the review, evaluate, and decide model. By the way, it's used in uh, child protective services as well. Uh, CFSA uses that now here in the District of Columbia. Uh, what we are moving to is actually uh, a call, what's called the structured decision-making model. I believe she had a question, question? about. Go ahead. I want to get the name of the model that you were using. Red model, review, evaluate, and decide model. 
And that model is, is uh, very effective in terms of being able to identify the risk, be able to uh, make a decision as to whether or not it is emergency or not emergency, and then to be able to decide as to the best way to, uh, to address that. So we've uh, used that model. It's used in some other places around the country. Uh, used a, a lot within uh, Child Protective Services, as I mentioned. And uh, we have uh, uh, decided to use it on the uh, adult side. Uh, we have been very successful in terms of being able to identify cases of, uh, uh, that are of vulnerable adults and to be able to try and address those. But we are finding that overall, I think the question was asked a little earlier as to what types of cases are we getting. We are now seeing more and more complicated cases that we are going out on that aren't just, and I'll let Mr. Craig talk about some of those because he actually, uh, as a supervisor, has staff that are uh, sometimes in life-threatening situations uh, where they are, uh, uh, the individual is in a vulnerable setting, but the person that's the believed to be the perpetrator is also, um, in some cases, threatening the social worker. And so we try to look at ways of being able to, as I said, to try and address the risk and to ensure that uh, the safety of the individual is, uh, is, is uh, uh, addressed as well as to ensure that staff are not in a vulnerable setting. Yes, ma'am. Just a couple, two quick questions. Going sure. back to your 1,485 cases active. And FY16, yes, ma'am. 16. And FY16. What range is that? Is that like fiscal year fiscal for year? the District of Columbia, yes, okay. is October 1 right. through uh, uh, September 30. Okay. And, and so uh, that the numbers, that 1,485 number that I referenced to you is for fiscal year 2016. 16. Right. Uh, our number for fiscal year 2015 was the 931 that I mentioned to you. And uh, right now, based upon the types of cases and the frequency that we are receiving these referrals, um, we look to be on, on track to be pretty close to the 1,400 number again. Wow. Uh, uh, why are we seeing an increase is probably the next logical question to that. And uh, I'll also allow Mr. Craig to try and help me out in that respect. But uh, we believe it's due to uh, a few reasons. Uh, one is more awareness of uh, cases of uh, abuse, neglect, self-neglect, and exploitation. Uh, our partnering with Metropolitan Police Department to be able to actually look at it. So we get sometimes police officers, um, and we'll talk about mandated reporters a little bit in, uh, as well. Uh, but uh, folks are contacting us on the hotline, uh, and we are then having to investigate or look at, at that. Uh, there are instances when we can't investigate, cannot, and those are uh, often when there's no address, so we don't know where to find the person. Uh, we can't investigate if we don't know where they are. We might look like we have S's on our chest, but uh, really the social workers don't. I do, but then, no, I'm only kidding. Uh, uh, we don't have that. What we do try to, to do is to uh, investigate all those cases that we have a legitimate address that we can actually go and visit and to uh, try and to uh, allow our social workers to make some dis discernment or uh, try and make a decision about uh, what is actually going on. Uh, so I've given you a little bit to tell you what we've ta told you so far, told you about the history of APS, talked to you about where we reside, talked to you about the number of people. I didn't tell you about, uh, uh, one thing I didn't tell you about is, I told you about the screening, uh, how we get the actual cases in, but we have an intake unit, of which Mr. Craig is the supervisor, uh, that actually uh, go out and actually have the first um, uh, interaction with uh, the vulnerable adult. We care for individuals that are, or interact with them on a temporary basis between uh, the uh, ages of 18 years of age and older. So if you are over 18, you have an opportunity to work with us uh, if you are referred or if you make a self-referral. If you are less than 18, we try to make the handoff to one of the other agencies that are able to try and provide that. Uh, I mentioned uh, CFSA, uh, that's one of those entities that does that. 
Uh, in addition to uh, that particular uh, part of the work we do, you know about the, the age of the individuals and intake uh, in terms of going out through the investigations. They have 60 days in which to actually accomplish uh, their work. Within that 60 days, that may be a good thing or may not be such a good thing, meaning that the risk may be uh, lessened. They may have found ways to work with the, uh, the older person or to the, the adult that is in need, but they also may find that there are some additional concerns that are out there requiring follow-up. And so uh, very often the individual is, uh, they have a case conference and they meet, social workers meet on the intake side and then on what we call the continuing services side. And uh, they meet, uh, discuss the case, have a case conference. And based on that information that is shared, there is a warm handoff of the information and the case is then worked by individual social workers on the continuing services side. And uh, on that side uh, of the, the fence, uh, we actually have a variety of uh, issues that they follow up on. So they have 60 days on the intake side to actually start their work, 10 days to actually start, 60 days to actually complete their investigation to find either it was substantiated or unsubstantiated, whatever the allegation was, those four allegations that I referred to in our mandate, the abuse, neglect, self-neglect, or exploitation. If they uh, do find that information, one sec, be right with you. If they do find that information, then uh, they are able to then uh, be able to, to identify that. Uh, in instances where it's continuing services, it's a handoff to them on the continuing services side. What they do is to actually continue to work the case, and they try to look at whether or not an individual has capacity. Uh, not the term that you see in the definition in, the, in, in uh, Webster's, but we refer to uh, uh, capacity in a slightly different way. I'll let Mr. Craig talk to you about that in more detail. But uh, what we, we tend to think of in terms of capacity are they have the ability to make decisions on their own. Now, we all are adults in this room. We all have the ability to make decisions for ourselves. Do we always make good decisions? You don't make good decisions all the time? Nope. I make them all the time. Oh, well, I try to, and uh, very often I make poor decisions too. But in instances where we are in uh, situations where an individual may be in a life-threatening setting uh, because of their own decision-making, uh, we, we try to help and assist. But if it's a lifestyle choice where the person decides I choose not to bathe, I choose uh, not to want to take care of things in my, in my apartment, and I want to do that. If that's a lifestyle choice, then that's, they have that ability. They have the independence uh, to be able to make that decision for themselves. But if they are a danger to themselves because of that, then that becomes a, a different uh, set of circumstances that we try to address. You had a question, so back to your question. Yes, ma'am. So you say you used to take from the age starting from 18? 18 years of, of age and older. And what types of individuals do we see at 18? Is that the question? Yeah, and then yeah, what age range is um, the most prominent cases that you have? Or the most prominent cases? Like, Mostly you? older persons. Uh, uh, 65 plus, but we are seeing a growing number of individuals who are folks who have had uh, uh, capacity issues, uh, deficits based on intellectual disability, uh, based on mental health, and substance abuse types of uh, issues that we see over time. Uh, we see uh, you know, uh, uh, some types of cognitive decline based on, uh, on uh, brain uh, dysfunction because of uh, opioid abuse, for example, or alcohol abuse over time. Uh, and they, they are not very good at decision making. We also see some things uh, that are really uh, uh, becoming very um, troublesome to us in, is this issue of uh, financial exploitation, where you see uh, confidence men and women get hold of an individual uh, who may have gotten out of the hospital. Maybe they're an older person, maybe they're not. They have uh, uh, you know, been told that they just won sweepstakes in Jamaica, and they, they'll need to go and pick up their winnings. 
but in the meantime, they need to set up an account for them uh, so be able to uh, wire the money, and they want them to wire it to a specific location. All they need is their, uh, their routing number from their bank. And of course, we know what happens then, right? Uh, the person comes in, uh, they say, I'm, I just won this switch space, I'm going to be getting $100,000, and I just gave them to them. And uh, all of my life savings is in my bank account, by the way. But uh, I know I'm going to, they're going to add another 100000 to like the, the 78000 that I worked all my life to hold on to. And uh, I have one little policy, a health insurance policy to go with that. And a little very old thing, but I know I'm going to get this, add to my 78000 I'm going to get this extra 100000 And then the next day, there's no money in their account. And the person is, uh, they've, they've lost it. And of course, uh, we don't have any extradition uh, rules with uh, country Jamaica, nor do we often get the FBI involved in such uh, of types of those uh, types of, of instances, but on occasion we do. Uh, and we can talk about financial exploitation in some great detail, but just trying to give you sort of the overview now and try to answer a few of your questions. Uh, but let me tell you what we've told you. I said we gave you the background, gave you the history of APS, we now told you, I didn't tell you how many supervisors we have on the intake side. We have two intake units, one that Mr. Craig is the supervisor for, and one that Ms. Uh, Toya Fisher is the supervisor for. Um, and those particular units then, uh, were, there are about five uh, social workers, licensed social workers on each side. They work their particular cases, and then uh, they either find uh, and substantiate the case that it has actually was. Uh, in cases where we're referring it to other entities, uh, we're able to do that. In some instances uh, where it's referred to continuing services, and then they find the person doesn't have capacity, then we, we try to take them to court, uh, meaning uh, on their behalf, we try to go to court. And uh, we involve the uh, office of the attorney general in that. We have a, uh, a lawyer who's an assistant attorney general working with us. And uh, we actually try to uh, uh, to file for guardianship and to get a guardian appointed to try and help take care of that individual. Uh, and that's a whole other discussion too. We'll be glad to try and answer some questions as they relate to that. But uh, that's what happens on the continuing services case to either uh, uh, lessen or to provide the types of supports necessary to type, to try and assist the individual. And they try to do that within a, an additional uh, uh, three, uh, three to uh, six months max. And uh, they try to put those systems in place to make that work. Is it a foolproof system? No. But do we save lives? Um, from the time he was a toddler, he's been doing that. And that's uh, Mr. Craig has actually worked to try and, and uh, help in saving people's lives. And I think if you hear from him as a social worker, one of uh, the questions that I asked him a long time ago is, what keeps you working these ridiculous hours that we work in, day in and day, night, day out, working on these issues? And he said, it's really rewarding for me to know that I've actually helped someone, and that I've actually, in many cases, saved somebody's life. And that's important. And I can only say amen to that, because I think that's really important. Uh, so. We told you a little bit about what the organization does, told you a little bit about what we do, told you a little bit about the number of cases that we see, we told you a little bit about how we try to address those cases, and we told you a little bit about what we do when we identify the cases. Now, what I haven't told you is what happens afterwards, because we do get repeat offenders, or I should say frequent flyers, or people that have issues, sometimes for the same issues in which they were referred to us initially, sometimes for additional reasons. But we try to uh, provide the type of, uh, of investigations and the type of, uh, of support necessary, as I said, to, to lessen the level of vulnerability for the adult and to ensure that they will be able to, uh, to live independently in, in some instances with assistance of family supports or community supports, and in those instances where they cannot to actually uh, go to court to try to get a guardian appointed for them to try and assist in that capacity. Once a guardian is assigned, 
we backed out. Remember I mentioned, or I, I didn't want to leave that out, uh, all of the work that we do is temporary. We have no long-term case management. We have no issues where we are providing services and support for people for, for uh, you know, eight, ten months, a year and a half. No, we don't do that. Uh, it's only temporary to try and, and lessen the level of vulnerability and then to be able to move out and to refer them accordingly or to be able to take uh, the, the potential individuals that have uh, been the perpetrators of the abuse or neglect to uh, be able to get them out of that setting and to uh, get other people who can more appropriately assist them. Okay, so um, uh, without uh, going too much further, and before we get to sort of the longer discussion that you may want to have in terms of specific questions and answers, I want to uh, refer and uh, hand things over to my colleague, uh, Mr. Clarence Craig, who will be able to kind of embellish on probably some of the points I've made and uh, refute any of the things I said incorrectly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Not but, at all. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, Mr. Clarence Craig. Thank you. Thank you. I, I do. Thank you, Dr. Cosby. Uh, I'm not as good as uh, Dr. Cosby, so I wrote some notes based on uh, some of the questions that were posed, and I agree they were excellent questions. Uh, so one of the questions was, uh, who do we serve? We serve impaired adults in the District of Columbia, 18 and over. So there must be some impairment. I definitely have to mention that. So there must be some physical impairment, mental impairment, visual impairment for Adult Protective Services to become involved. One of the questions and one of the comments from Dr. Cosby was that, again, we work with those 18 and over. I thought this was a great question. We see a number of cases of seniors in the District of Columbia, older persons. We're seeing an increase of uh, cases of those 100 and over. Uh, we've had quite a few of those in the last couple of years, so I did just want to mention that as well. Uh, one of the questions was about RED, and I appreciate your asking that question. So RED is Review, Evaluate, and Decide. Years and years ago, what Dr. Cosby didn't tell you, which I don't like people to know, is that I've actually worked with Adult Protective Services for over 30 years. So yes, I was a toddler when I started with Adult Protective Services. But years ago, it was just left up to me to make the decision as to whether a case was appropriate for adult protective services or not appropriate. Heaven forbid if something happened to someone, it was going to fall on me. So I really, really appreciate the red team. So it's a team that meets on a daily basis, uh, review, evaluate, and decide. All of the supervisors are involved with the red team. Uh, our attorney, when available, is involved with the red team. And occasionally, our chief, uh, Dr. Sheila Jones, as well as Dr. Robert Cosby, our program analyst. Um, we, it varies. Some days we may only have two cases that we're meeting on. There are days where we've had 16 cases, and we have literally been in a red team session for what seems to be 16 hours. Uh, it's, I'm sorry, what seems to be three hours. See, he uh, meant 16. You <laughs> right. really didn't mean that. But three hours. Uh, we've been in for 16 cases. And during that session, we are actually going over each line. We are calling referrer, referrers back. We're calling collaterals back. We're calling neighbors, church members, everyone, so that we can make what we feel is the right decision, rather to screen a case in, screen a case out. So, Dr. Cosby also talked about emergency, non-emergency. So, if you called Adult Protective Services and we felt that this is not a life-threatening situation, we would have 10 business days to begin an investigation. If it is life-threatening, we have 24 hours. What's life-threatening? Life-threatening would be if we received a call saying that a caretaker suddenly had to go to the hospital, and this leaves the impaired, vulnerable adult home without supervision. We'd go right out on a case like that, because we may have to intervene. We may have to put a home health aid in. We may have to call family members or come up with something so that the person would have appropriate supervision. If someone is evicted, 
They were a wheelchair rider and they were evicted. They had no place to go. We receive those kinds of calls as well. Well, that's a vulnerable adult who's immediately in need of attention. So that might be considered an emergency situation for Adult Protective Services. The other situations that you typically hear that there's um, uh, someone who might be exploited, uh, that generally is considered a non-emergency. So we would have 10 business days to begin that type of an investigation. What are the kinds of cases we would screen out? Well, we received a call last week from a woman who said that she had not eaten in three days. She had not eaten in three days. She had not received her medication in three days. So I immediately got the call and said, okay, well, you know, this sounds like an emergency. She hasn't eaten in days. She hasn't taken medication in days. Let's further investigate. So started calling around. Called her, she said that, yeah, it's true, she hadn't eaten, she hadn't taken medication. I called other folks and they said, well, I'm not so sure that that's true. So what we later learned was that she was living with a caretaker. The caretaker had been taken away by the police. Mm -hmm. um, it was a domestic violence situation and she wanted the gentleman to come back into the home. So she started calling various government agencies, Adult Protective Services, the Metropolitan Police, others, to do what she thought she could to bring the caretaker back to the home as quickly as possible. So in doing our investigation, we actually called the police, which we will frequently do. We have a memorandum of agreement with the police. So we called the police and requested that the police do a welfare check. As fate would have it, the same officer who arrested the gentleman who had actually physically abused her uh, just days before was the same officer who conducted the welfare check. And that officer uh, called me back and said, trust me, she is eating, trust me, she is taking her medication. This seems to be just a ploy to get him back as quickly as possible. So that was actually a case that we recorded in our system but we actually screen the case out. Um, another situation where we may screen a case out is if we somehow, during the red team session, learn that the person does not actually live in the District of Columbia. Uh, that might be another example of a screen out case. Um, I would say to you that I have worked for Adult Protective Services for a number of years. Dr. Cosby is correct that I do feel that we have saved lives. I think often of the worst case that I have seen since I've been with APS. It actually just occurred last year, just a couple of months ago. We received a call at about four o'clock from an employee counselor who said that for the first time, her uh, employee had revealed that he was being physically abused. So we actually went out to the job site that particular day, myself as well as another social worker. When we arrived, ladies and gentlemen, I have never seen so many welts on <clears throat> someone's body as I saw that particular day. I knew that there was no way that I could put my head on the pillow that night and let that gentleman go back to that same caretaker. So we did call the police. Uh, the police became involved. We subsequently made arrangements for that gentleman to go elsewhere. We did not obviously let the caretaker know where he was. Uh, the case subsequently um, went to court. That uh, gentleman uh, subsequently was appointed a guardian. Um, it was a very difficult and challenging situation. Um, I will say that we confronted uh, the caretaker and just to hear some of the things that she told us, just in my view, this is a Clarence Gregg opinion, just seemed ridiculous. She would abuse him because he used the bathroom in the house and he was smelling of the house. Mm. So that prompted abuse. Mm. Um, she, he didn't go to McDonald's and get the right order for her. So this prompted her to abuse him. Wow. Just, I mean, just very hard to hear, very hard to see the worlds. Um, we had another situation that always comes to mind. 
a gentleman, 97 years old, uh, who was living in a house. A woman who lived across the alley uh, had been put out and had requested that uh, he allow her to stay with him. So he consented. And what he didn't know at the time when he gave permission was that she moved in, and she moved in a snake, mm. cats, mm. dog, mm. rabbit, etc. <laughs> so it was just another terrible situation. Yeah. Clearly, she was taking advantage of him. So exploitation, I say this to say, exploitation isn't always just financial. You can take advantage of someone's property as well. So we became involved with that situation. Um, I am not an advocate, I must say, for placing one in a nursing home, but uh, subsequently a guardian was appointed for that gentleman as well, and he celebrated his 100th birthday, actually, in a nursing home. Um, as I said, I have stayed with Adult Protective Services for these years, I'm sure, because I do feel that we have saved lives. I do agree with Dr. Cosby, yes, we probably could do some things better, but, uh, you know, I'm proud of the work that we do. Um, I guess I'll just stop there and ask, at this point, are there any questions? Any questions for Dr. Cosby or myself about what we have discussed? Yeah. Sir? Uh, yes, um, what you just mentioned the word towards me, do, does the adult protective or protective service do they enter, enter into like nursing homes and when, when there's a complaint or question related to them? Uh, no, I, I, was, I was just saying it's a very good question. Uh, the issues related to the nursing homes, we, we work with the long-term care ombudsmen uh, primarily since they are uh, mandated to serve that particular population. Uh, but there are instances where we've worked in collaboration with uh, with uh, long-term care ombudsman to try to address issues uh, of an individual who has been abused or neglected within a, uh, a nursing home setting, nursing facility. We advocate very much for uh, home and community-based services and support, and so we try to do that wherever possible, but certainly recognize that, uh, that abuse, neglect, self-neglect, and exploitation, hopefully not self-neglect in a nursing facility, but we do see that um, that occur as well. Um, so we, we do, uh, what, what we also see is uh, it's happening is instances where individuals are uh, having difficulties within a, uh, uh, a setting where they, are, they want to be uh, institutionalized, they want to go to a nursing facility, mm -hmm. but for a variety of reasons uh, can't get there. They don't meet the financial requirements, or they can't get the types of uh, uh, evaluations done for them to meet their level of care determination, saying they really do need it. Uh, we actually have had instances where individuals have been uh, homeless, and uh, they would like to live in a nursing facility because they believe that that's you know, a safe place to live, but they don't meet the criteria being that, that level of care need isn't, isn't there, isn't appropriate. And so they've been sort of vacillating between the community and the facility, and we've actually had to go out and, and try to uh, mitigate and try and work on some of those issues as well. Yes. There's talk throughout some communities about these perpetrators being prosecuted. What is happening with these egregious cases? And is there some level that gets to the attorney general for, or the attorney for D.C. where it stops and doesn't go up to the federal? Because the talk is that they're not being prosecuted at the federal level. And they're the ones who are responsible. That's, uh, is that uh, true? Uh, or another, no? another great question. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want me to take a stab at it? What's the good of it if you're not uh, prosecuted? So, uh, an excellent question. Um, our social workers who work the cases often uh, ask that question a lot, and we internally kind of do a little bit of hand wringing around that issue to try and, and look at what that means. We have had some difficulties, uh, to be honest with you, in terms of uh, trying to make the handoff to 
the uh, Metropolitan Police Department. They have a, a financial and crimes unit that we work with, a cyber crimes unit that uh, we work with, and we have an excellent working relationship with them. But here's one of the things that happens, and we, I put this in the category of uh, why we don't have statehood. Uh, because uh, we don't have, we're not a state, we don't have our own attorney general that can actually make these types of decisions. So if there's criminal issues involved, it is referred to the U.S. Attorney. Uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, for the District of Columbia is at the federal level, and they prosecute. So um, many of you have probably watched uh, all those TV shows where there are police involved and attorneys, etc. cetera. Uh, in many cases, uh, the attorneys at the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office are looking for convictions. And so in order for them to get convictions, they're looking at increasing the odds that they will get convictions. So if they believe that there will be a, a, a time and frame in which uh, it's going to take a lot of time to approve a particular case, or if they is, there's going to be an issue where it may be 50-50, as opposed to 80-20 or 90-10, that they will actually be able to prosecute, they often don't want to take the case. So you can imagine the frustration on the parts of Adult Protective Services who feel you have, we've done everything necessary to try and give you a particular case. Sometimes we actually say we gave you everything, tied it up and put a bow on it and said, here, this is all you got to do. And we find that there are still problems. I can tell you internally for the, the APS and talking to folks at Metropolitan Police Department, they also share that frustration. Does that mean that we don't continue to try? No, we actually try quite, quite a lot and quite hard. I serve as the liaison with the Metropolitan Police Department. And after they finish with the red model review and we have a, uh, a particular case of uh, exploitation, and as I said, very often of late financial exploitation, we immediately try to try and hand over as much of that information to uh, Metropolitan, Metropolitan Police Department so they can conduct their investigation. And uh, you know, in some cases, we think uh, some people belong under the jail, but that's mm -hmm. not our decision to make. That has to be done through the, the proper it's jurisprudence. And we, uh, you know, it's still, it's still in our country, you're innocent until proven guilty. And everyone has allowed their day in court. But there are some things that we think could be different on behalf of the, uh, the vulnerable adults that we, we try to, to assist. So uh, we'll continue to try to do that. But uh, you're right in that we do come up against that as a challenge. We need more advocacy for that. Absolutely. One quick question to juxtapose it. On the other end of the spectrum with children, is it the same situation pretty much, would you, would you say? I, I can't speak to that. I don't okay. work with, uh, with children. Because uh, I, I think this, the, the data would show that some of those are important issues, but I, I, I would not be the, I, I, that's not my area of expertise, and I, I don't think I could speak cogently on that. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Hello, Dr. Crosby. Yes. Hello. Hello. Good, Good to see, to see you again. <laughs> I'm Deborah Royster, yes. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Seabury, and we used to work together. So yes, we did. Good to see you. Um, um, I, Thank you for allowing us to be here oh, today. Absolutely. Thank you for being here uh, today. And I, I just want to commend you for the work that, the great work that you do. Just know how much you do with the very small staff that you have to really uh, to, to thoroughly investigate cases of, and allegations of abuse involving. You mentioned, I just have a question. Thank you. You mentioned that <clears throat> you serve um, older adults who have either physical or cognitive impairments. When you first get the call, you may or may not know that. How do you go about the process of making that determination so you'll know whether or not to go forward with the next step and actually get involved? Very good question. Um, I'll start with Mr. Craig and I'll try and add on if you like. But. Uh, for the most part, we may call the referrer back and seek information and, and we'll specifically ask the question, is there some vulner, 
vulnerability. Uh, otherwise, I would quite honestly tell you, as a red team member, you can correct me if I'm wrong, we would go ahead and screen that case in. Let assign it to a social worker, have the social worker to go out and then make that determination of the appropriateness of that matter. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes, sir. Two sort of related questions. I, I take it you really don't get involved in a case where the major impairment is a bad choice in who they married. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sadly, sometimes we do. We do. We do. Okay. Cause, cause of, I've know. actually had a case, and it was my case, uh, where there was an older person who met a younger man and showed the wedding dress. And, and she was so proud that, you know, she was going to get married and marrying this gentleman. And quite honestly, as the assigned social worker, I could very clearly see he was exploiting her. He was going to the bank and taking money out. So Adult Protective Services did become involved, because, but there was um, some concerns about memory. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I know the, the, the cases the police hate to get involved in most is the domestic yeah. abuse cases. Yes. What do you, because, because they're likely to be attacked by the spouse. It's dangerous for them as well. Yes, right, right. But do you run into cases where people clearly are being abused, and, and I'm thinking of a friend of mine who's not elderly, um, <clears throat> but is not, does not believe he's being abused, he or she is being abused, and really wants you to leave him alone? And, and what do you do in cases like that? That's uh, a long, we, we, we wrestle with that too. Okay. Um, and so I put that, or maybe you put that in the category of if you don't want help and you have the ability to make your own decisions and you choose to make poor ones, then that's still yours to yeah. do. Yeah, okay. Uh, however, if there are instances where there is some belief that perhaps they might not have all of their uh, ability to think clearly, uh, where there may be some cognitive decline, uh, then that may be some way of being able to look at it. And so there's, when there are friends involved, for example, or family members, it's often very difficult to say. You may know the person has had difficulties. You say, okay, well, uh, they drink a lot on occasion, but not really. Uh, or they used to do substance abuse, uh, used to do uh, legal pharmaceuticals and occasionally illegal, but we were, when we were young, everybody did something. It was okay back then. And then, and so there's always a little bit of uh, excuse that's offered for the individual. And then you find out that maybe that's what you knew, but in addition to that, they were doing X, Y, and Z things that you didn't know about. And suddenly, it's a situation where there has been cognitive decline. And we just, uh, we're working with a, uh, one of the noted uh, experts, a uh, uh, psychologist, uh, who does these national uh, uh, programs on financial exploitation, which shows cognitive decline actually starting uh, as much as uh, you know, four or five years before people actually know enough to see some of the same things. So they may say, okay, I, we did a, mini mental uh, exam with them, uh, they were oriented times three, but when you came to dealing with more difficult questions about analytically, could they make a logical decision, could they uh, multiply, add, and divide numbers to be able to look at something and say, oh, well, I'm not great at math, I'd have that problem either, that too, but suddenly you see that, well, maybe you might have been able to decide something, so they may speak clearly and say everything's fine, and then uh, go ahead and sign the document to have a home equity line for their house when their house has been paid, paid off. And yes, they may need some work, but it was only to repair a window and door, not to have the roof done and the bathroom done. And those, old, those were jobs that they signed up for, but maybe only part of the bathroom was done and nothing else was done, but they're $100,000 poorer now. And that money's not coming back. Uh, we see that happening, and, uh, and those are tough decisions for families to be able to look at or for friends to look at, and 
you know, when you say, well, maybe, uh, maybe Ali or uh, Jamil or uh, Susan or, uh, you know, Sharon may have problems and we don't want to say they do, uh, that's, that's really what, what's out there. The gentleman has just described the biggest challenge for me in working for Adult Protective Services, and that is when you have to walk away when you really know and believe something is going on, but you have to walk away because the person is thought to have capacity to make that decision. Um, our general counsel often lets us know, you can't keep going back if they say, I don't want any services because it borders on harassment. Yes. What, what is kind of the process, what do you do if someone is screened out and you still see that there's things they can get a second referral. Mm -hmm. They can have someone else contact us. Uh, they can contact us themselves if they want to make a self-referral. Uh, so that, that does happen. And I, I mentioned sort of frequent flyers. We have instances where there are lots of cases where you know people had a need in 2011, had a need in 2013, had a need in 2015, and here it is 2016, and the need is here again. Maybe it's not for the same thing, or maybe it's for multiple things now. What if, that. what if someone's from, it sounds like you get a fair amount from Maryland, for example. Do they, do you guys refer them on to? Mm. Okay. Definitely. Yeah. They're not district residents, and they don't reside in the District of Columbia. Um, we, we can't do anything. The other part that's interesting is sometimes you will have an individual who had uh, a residence here in the district. Uh, they moved with friends or family to Maryland or to another adjoining jurisdiction, um, Virginia, or they went to see other family members in North Carolina and they come back. And uh, maybe the reason they came back isn't because they don't need assistance, but because they can't stand their family <laughs> or they don't like the issues that are going on. And maybe the family is looking for a way to pay some other bills and they're the vehicle to help them do that. So we see all of those types of things and more. Uh, but they, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, lessen the fact that there is a need if they are residents in the district, and we do try to provide that level of help and assistance. But if they're not here in our jurisdiction, then we cannot do that. Sure. And we will refer to the appropriate jurisdiction. Other questions? Yes, sir. Um, you said you're working with uh, the 10 day window for yes. addressing the issues. Um, my question would be you've had a 50% increase in cases in a year. How is the staffing the uh, issue addressing the staffing in relation to the. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> well, no, no, so, our, our uh, supervisor, Dr. Sheila Jones, will hear this when, we, when she sees the Twitter feed. Uh, uh, we, we actually. Uh, uh, have had several discussions to try and address that. The, uh, you know, management uh, has lots of, lots of alligators that they're trying to work around and issues that they're trying to be able to address. And adult protective service increase in, in our, our clientele is just one of those issues. Um, we are kind of in a, a good and bad situation. When you have more cases, there's no worry about obsolescence of jobs. Uh, but there is a big need that's there for additional people to help do the work. And um, our, our staff are working quite hard with you know, the resources that we do have. Everyone, and I'm sure you all probably hear that too, when you have more work, they say be more efficient. And when you uh, are more efficient, they say, well, work long hours when you need to. And so um, at some point, there is a push-pull there, but I think that we try to do the best we can with what we have. And we've been told that um, we don't really have additional resources or, or really additional space for people if we were able to get them in because um, the, the, the space within our, our agency is, uh, is tight. We do have uh, resources uh, above what some other parts of our Department of Human Services has, meaning that all of our people are in one place. We do have a small conference room that people can go to if they need to. Um, a number of years ago, uh, leadership moved to bullpen style uh, desks, so uh, only the, the uh, chief has a, a 
Dr. Jones has a, a closed off office. Everyone else is in an open desk area. Uh, cube farms, as people in a negative way say sometimes, but nonetheless, we have uh, space for the people that we do have. We don't have very much additional work space to accommodate lots of additional staff. So the, the short answer to what you asked is um, we've brought it up to folks and they are aware that we have this issue, but we are working with what we have right now. Was that fair? Yes. Yeah. Sort of a related question. Given that there's a, a, a great shortage of affordable housing, uh, in D.C., and given that uh, pension, even if people have pensions, the cost of living is pegged to the general economy, not the particular market basket that seniors have. Um, what remedies do you have if, you, if somebody's living there because they can't afford to live anyplace else? What can you do? Let's just start very limited. Yeah, I, I hear you. Very limited. Um, I think, and I really want to emphasize the agreement that we have with the Metropolitan Police. I think I have seen a little more action, and this might address your uh, question as well, a little more toward prosecuting alleged perpetrators. Um, but to answer the gentleman's question, I, I do think that the memorandum of agreement with the police is actually and that's a fairly recent uh, memorandum of random agreement. So, but you, you actually put your finger on the pulse of what is a larger issue as well, and that is that we have, uh, with the changing demographics in the District of Columbia, the fact that we're getting, um, I think the last number I looked at was back in November, um, a thousand new people coming to live in Washington every month. Uh, and. Uh, with that, they're typically often uh, individuals who are single, and they have resources. Uh, and so when you have an individual on a fixed income coming up against someone that, that has resources to buy the type of, or rent the type of uh, place they want to live in, uh, and even instances where people don't have as much, but because they're, you know, they're 25 and willing to spend half their income on housing because it's near great restaurants and bars and places they want to hang out. They're willing to do that as opposed to the person who is the older person who is spending half the resources to stay in a place that may not be as wholesome or the neighborhood has changed, et cetera, because those individuals or the individuals that were in another part of the city are being pushed more and more into the area where the seniors are. And we do see those instances of, of, uh, you know, of abuse and exploitation where you know, the, the grandson is coming to uh, live with uh, grandma. I mean, we had one not too long ago where, uh, you know, the grandson was having a substance abuse problem and uh, weren't sure if he was actually thinking clearly or for, for whatever reason, he, he punched his grandmother in the face and when she was down, kicked her in the head. And uh, she managed to get to the hospital and took care of herself and you know, forgave her grandson and said, well, she was ready to go back home. And we're like, well, hold on, you know, we don't want to put you back into a situation where they're in a vulnerable setting. And so those are the kinds of things that we, we do see more than you might think. And uh, they are instances that don't seem to be kosher, and we don't think it's a good thing for folks to be in that, that situation. But it's also a difficult thing if they do say they don't want help. And they, you know, this is a family matter, and we'll take care of it ourselves. Um, and we may know that that means you'll continue to get exploited, or you will not get the type of support until someone's taking you to the hospital for the last time. Um, but it's it's the dilemma and the uh, the difficulty that uh, that the APS staff address and address, I think, as well as they can, given the circumstances, uh, to try and address these really important issues. And admittedly, the only housing resources that we have are shelters, nursing homes, group homes. So that's the, that's all that's open to us in terms of the availability of what's out there. Uh, but it doesn't, uh, you know, often we then try to find out if they have 
family members or individuals that they can provide uh, or can get support, uh, provide support for them. And some some cases that's upside down where the younger people or the, the daughters, the granddaughters, the grandkids, the nieces and nephews, they're looking to that person to provide the resources either because they own their town home or because they have a single family house or they have a bank account or in some cases they just have a regular income. They are receiving a social security check or a, and or a pension uh, to go with what they're doing. And uh, it, it, it's sometimes tragic and we do feel a little cynical about it sometimes, but uh, it's the work that 